What's going on, Ambitious Vet? Thanks for diving inside the trenches with us again this week as we seek to provide you the golden grenades to get yourself out of your own way, but also fuel your, fuel your desire to make an impact post-military. This is your podcast built by veterans for veterans as we dive into the trenches with today's top subject matter experts, share inspiring transition stories, and provide master classes to equip you to reach your full potential. Bottom line is, this is your place to go after immediate transition education expires. Are you ready to dive deeper inside the trenches of the Ambitious Vet Network? Or maybe you're looking to get some exclusive, um, you know, private membership type exclusive news. Well, Ambitious Vet, go check out vettrainingcoaching.com. When that pop-up pops up, make sure to, to subscribe with your name and your email, and that will allow you access to receive our weekly newsletter that has our uh, recent updates as far as content, um, updates as far as news updates with the Ambitious Vet Network and what we're up to that only um, our email list is up to date with, um, and also just some opportunities to continue to fuel your ambitions post-military Rather that be networking events, um, biz dev opportunities, or whatever that may be, keeping in mind that we trust your feedback with providing those opportunities and curating that all inside the newsletter. We see that as the heartbeat inside of our brand, and we hope to see you as the newest subscriber. Again, that's vettrainingcoaching.com. Go there and add it to another weekly habit and fueling your post-military ambitions. It's time to get into the trenches, dig dig into your purpose, and and fire up your life fulfillment. The Ambitious Vet Podcast starts now. What's going on, Ambitious Vet? We are right back inside the trenches with Susan Samos. Susan is someone who, with uh, 25 years of public sector and corporate experience and 11 years of government as a Marine Field Wire woman that believes in authenticity in all areas of your life. Ambitious Vet, whenever I put out a call for guest, guest speakers on inside this podcast and if some of the biggest... Uh, Marine Corps LinkedIn group. She was one of the first ones to raise her hand, hands inside that group, and uh, you know, been getting to know her. This is now going to be our second conversation. This one's going to be recorded, so we got to kind of limit the Marine Corps f bombs. But we're, you know, I'm super excited to get to know her more and have you get to know her more, as uh, she has a pretty awesome uh, story and also philosophy. Um, around how to establish yourself, getting established post-military based on who you are, not what the transitional TAPS program tells you that you should be. But I'm going to go ahead and shut my mouth. I'm going to welcome Susan to the show. Susan, Susan, are you there? I'm here. Nice to be here. Hey, welcome, welcome, welcome. And go ahead and fill the gaps inside the introduction, starting with like, where are you based and uh, yeah, maybe maybe something else that could just fill the gaps inside that introduction. Um, there's not many gaps there. I live in California. Super expensive out here, so I'm just trying to keep up nowadays. Um, I have two children that are grown. Uh, one's 26 and one is about to turn 20. So I have a lot of free time and um just put it into my work and building my network and supporting others as much as I can. I love it. I love it, man. Last time I checked a Marine Corps buddy of mine lives in LA and I think the gas prices were something crazy, like $8 a gallon. Pretty much. We're um, we've hit $7 in some areas and I, I, you know, I don't even know what to say about that. I think I do a lot more different options than driving. (laughs) I should say that. (laughs) Yeah. Kind of adapt and overcome with those gas prices. It's funny. I've been telling my friends, Hey, as long as your credit score is higher than the gas prices, you're good. Exactly. (laughs) (laughs) And you know, you know, at some point, if it goes over seven fifty, I mean, who knows you, it may not be 
may not be possible, but um, it's just crazy. But yeah, thanks for filling the gaps with that. But uh, Susan, you know, you were one, you're one of the few that, that we've actually interviewed here that has a great corporate transition story and has gotten inside the, the corporate world. And you never, you know, you never really pivoted out of telecommunications, right? Which is pretty cool. You went from a, a field wire men or woman um, to telecommunications and you've never really looked back. Um, can you just walk us through your transition out of the Marine Corps and the first few years and how you kind of, you know, kind of started establishing yourself in telecommunications? Um, it, it is a lot different than what it is today because you got to remember, we didn't use technology and connect on the level and at the rate that we do today. So back then, uh, there was a full page ad in the Los Angeles Times where GTE was hiring. Now, the position that I applied for was, it had nothing to do with actual physical wiring and the job field that I was in in the Marine Corps. It was basically starting at the bottom. So that's a big ego bust when you start mm -hmm. at the bottom. And I started in residential taking calls, but in the back of my mind, I knew what it what the end goal was and what the work is behind what I'm giving to a customer. So my confidence through the Marine Corps and the skills and the knowledge, I started at the bottom taking calls. And back then, it wasn't like you put your resume online and, and everybody out there was saying, don't put pictures, don't do, make your resume this way or that way. I've always gone against the grain and, and I actually put an image on the top of my resume of a girl, a woman looking out on a coastline, kind of just daydreaming. And I faxed that in and I was so surprised. I actually got called. I had to drive two hours to start the process. And they, back then, they did it where it was pass or fail. So there was multi-levels. So if you pass the first piece, they called you back to come out, do the next piece. Well, because I lived two hours away and I was a uh, military, they were actually, they said, we'll just get you going through all of the processes in one day. So that was amazing mm -hmm. to be considered like that. Yeah. Um, that was how I started. I started at the bottom. I didn't jump out with the expectation that I'm going to get this top level job or even a job in my field. I just wanted something close to it that I was familiar with. So I was, I was on the outskirts of it. Mm. Yeah. 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 <clears throat> so you didn't fall victim to the taps and tams where they're pushing you into police officer security guard. So that's always good. Yeah. Um, and uh, you sent them a picture of a girl overlooking the coastline and they started the interview or the, the interview process from there, huh? Yes. And, and back then, uh, you know, like I said, we didn't have it where you submit online. I faxed it and I, I don't want to say that I didn't take it seriously. I just, I just put it out there. Um, I was hopeful, but I wasn't relying on it um, because I'm always trying different avenues. I didn't basically, I didn't put all my eggs in one basket. I didn't want to have that mentality. Hmm. So that was just one of the things you sent that in. weren't taking it really serious. Was that at least you in that picture, that girl overlooking the coastline? Not at all. It was just, <laughs> a, it was just an amazing graphic and everyone was like don't do that it's they're not even gonna look at your resume and I was like I beg to differ if they're gonna deny me over a picture versus my skills what does that say about that doesn't say something about me it says something about them and I may have missed this um, but what was the job offer it was uh basically customer service resi residential customer service and you sent them a picture overlooking the coastline. Interesting. Yeah. Interesting. Come on. That's a, that's a, like a glass breaker. Like if that came in, I'd be like, Hey, what, what's that? And it, and you said you faxed it in. So it's like, that thing's making noise. What's, what the hell is this? Yeah. Um, and then they started the process. Interesting. So that was your first job. 
was that in the industry of telecommunications? Yes. And okay. first time ever being in a multi-level building with different layers of management and um, having to pivot on a daily basis from peer to management and vice versa and customer all in one day. Hmm. Very nice. Very nice. Yeah. I mean, that's, I think that, you know, from coming from a military perspective, we're not used to those multi-level buildings. I forget. Yeah. You don't think about that. It's like, whoa, you know what? The mail room's on this floor, executive yeah. office on this floor, and just one of those things. So yeah, that could be, that could be overwhelming per se, especially when you're kind of in a more of a white collar versus a blue collar environment as well, which, you know, enlisted Marines could, you know, feel that way, right? Where you're, it's not always suit and tie. It's rolling up your sleeves, making sure your sleeves are tight and your camis are ironed, right? So. And, and not only that, if you think about it, when we were in our military days, you had that handful of people that you interacted with every single day, right? You went into your shop, you saw the same people until they transitioned out or went to another duty station. And that was that. So mm -hmm. having to grow your, your, your circle, I should say, or seeing the other departments, you didn't go to the other departments unless you physically went in there or they came to you. So here you are, try to imagine coming from that environment into a, a three level building with a thousand people and two wings. You had a north side and a south side of the building. Mm -hmm. And some of those people you don't ever see, ever. You can never pass them because you don't go there. But you're passing, you're in a building of a thousand people you don't mm -hmm. know. That can be, for someone transitioning from one environment to that, that's a huge shock. And it's a, a complete opposite. Yeah. So I can tell you for seven years, my first seven years, I really didn't talk to a lot of people. I just had that military mentality. You just do your job, get in, get out. Um, and if you're not in my circle, I don't affiliate. It was hard. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. it was hard. Stayed on your floor, right? In yes. other words. Yeah, it's just, it's, and we'll dive more into like what happened next and how you evolved and, and, and stuff like that. But I just wanted to share like, it's funny, yours was a picture of a woman overlooking the coastline. For me, uh, my first job, I worked for a major commercial gym because, you know, I was like one of my passions in the Marine Corps was fitness. And uh, I was horrible in my interview. Horrible. Like I was stuttering. Like I did not have, I did not do good networking. I didn't do, I played Marine Corps till like my, you know, my transition date. And, uh, you know, I just didn't do good at putting all my ducks in a row. And the funny thing is what made the biggest difference though, is I attended an unemployment workshop or something, those free workshops you can go to at the unemployment office. And they taught me how to write a handwritten thank you note of consideration. I walked in, gave the hiring manager or the club manager of this gym that, and I probably even stuttered while I was handing it over to her. But, uh, you know, when I handed it over to her, she was like, you know what, you're going to hear from us in the next hour, two hours. And it was a high demand entry level sales position. But, uh, you know, over the course following two hours, they gave me a call. I was like, Hey, you can, can you come in to start a new hire orientation next Monday? And I was like, Holy cow, little small things like sending a picture, doing a handwritten note saying, thank you can really overcome our immediate insecurities of what do I do with my hands? How do I talk civilian and all that good stuff? Right. But let me ask you this. So when you did that though, you know, how normally most people won't do that. Was there because I always try to explain to people, there's this gut feeling, whether you call it going against the grain, was there a feeling in you like, I've got to get this thank you letter, or mm. did you feel like you have to do it because that's what they taught you? Um, that's a really good question. I think I'm, I think I was raised in the Midwest. So it was kind of like for my value systems is how do you do something that's very personable? right? That separates yourself from someone else, right? Mm -hmm. And I didn't think any anybody else would go and take the extra effort to write a handwritten note. I, I, I didn't know. Um, and I was to say, hey, this might be my way of showing a little extra oomph 
in a personable mm-hmm. way, you know, um, yeah. to, to see what happened. So it was kind of like, to your point, it was kind of more intuitive of like, Hey, I was raised in the Midwest. We got that genuine personable feel. And I was like, this seems like a good tactic to do, especially I need to get my bills paid soon. You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> yes. so that was one of those things too. Right. Yeah. Um, but thanks for sharing that. So now you get in, you get into this, this entry level customer service job, which is, you know, get you in, you know, I know that feeling of landing that first job when you get post-military, it's a huge win, right? Which I think a lot of veterans that are listening to this are on different phases of transition. They may still be in the uniform. They may just be getting out. And there's also ambitious vets that have been out for a while, but are just figuring out how do they thrive in their ideal career, not just financial stability. Now, as you were getting you know, you know, further evolved, acclimated, I guess you would say in the civilian sector, kind of walk us through those, those milestones in your career post-military and how did you kind of gain more clarity on getting established and who you really are? Um, so when I got slowly elevated from being I want to say I kind of was antisocial because of the environment we went from and where we go to. And former vets or vets in the company, when the military holidays would come around, you started to get to know them. And those were the ones that ha- got me to open up a little bit. But hmm. the the minimal thing that separated me from some of my peers at work was the attention to detail, my accountability, my bearing. So basically everything that I did in the Marine Corps, I just took it as I'm doing what I did in the Marine Corps, just in a different setting. And that helped me a little bit. And that goes a long way because it doesn't matter what profession you're in, when they have projects, deadlines, uh, something that needs a skill set that you, sometimes you just can't teach or just pick someone from the crowd and say, hey, I need you to work this. That's where you start to stand out. And then you start to elevate with um, being offered positions, um, uh, higher pay or more support, more support and more options is the best way to say it. Yeah. Yeah. That's a good point because the measurement in the civilian world to get promoted in the corporate world, that is not, we're not even hitting on entrepreneurship <clears throat> is in the military. We're used to tenure and rank, right? Time and grade, stuff like that. That's how you get promoted to high pay, higher pay, higher responsibility, more team members to be responsible for stuff like that. In the corporate world, it can be totally different, Right the different metrics of performance um, that you have to hit. But the cool thing is in the civilian world, if you leverage like the bearing, the attention to detail, you can get promoted quicker, you know? And that was something we were actually talking about just in our pre-interview a few days ago too. Susan was like, man, like, we're bragging about Marines because we're both Marines and we like to (laughs) geek out on that. But I mean, all, (laughs) all, all military branches, right? You know, we're so mission driven, meaning we're so outcome focused. We're just so focused on getting shit done that it, there's no time off switch, right? right. Um, which is good. And I think any boss likes that. But I also can see on the flip side in the civilian world, bosses do like someone that can slow down and build team and teamwork and interpersonal skills to build relationships as well. Have you found that to be valuable for yourself? I mean, how long have you been out of the Marine Corps now? Ooh, uh, 2006 or eight. I always get it. You know, I am older now. So either 2006 <laughs> or 2008. <laughs> I know it's funny. I, I got out in 2012, but I always forget about the month. It was March 24th, though, 2012. I got out. I'll never forget that day. My life changed forever, but sometimes I can forget the month. So I get that. So you've been out for a while now. You know, have you have you seen it valuable to kind of slow down, not be so mission driven and kind of slow down to build interpersonal skills? Are you still focused on outcomes? What's your secret sauce to you? Mm. You know, well, you are post military like it was for us in military. You know, we we take what was what was the 
one of our general rules where we take care of our junior Marines. Mm -hmm. It was hard for me to look at my peers as a junior Marine, but something in me clicked one day because it is hard to communicate. So I started to look at my peers as a junior Marine and I had to soften myself. And trust me, it's an everyday, everyday skill you have to work on. Even at this age, I'm still doing it. Is I have to understand we're not synced up. They don't understand me. How can I help them understand so we can achieve our objective? Mm -hmm. And I have to understand not every move, everybody moves fast. And I have to adjust for that and be patient. So that's an everyday skill. And surprisingly, in the civilian sector, when they see a leader, they know it. When your shoulders are back, you're making eye contact, you're pausing and you're thinking about what they're saying, you're paraphrasing or confirming what they're saying. It goes a long way. You lead, they will follow. Mm. Yeah. I love the active, active listening component that you're talking about, you know, as far as like slowing down, emphasizing, you know, I saw a good meme the other day. You might get a kick out of this where it showed like an audio file like kind of like on podcasts you can see like the audio file and you can see when someone's talking and when no one's talking and they were talking about the gap between the audio of two people talking that was um what they quoted as empathy right and that mm -hmm. was part of the most uh, impactful part of the conversation of people not talking which i just thought was was incredible right because mm -hmm. it's someone actually slowing down not reacting and processing what the other person has said and, uh, you know, potentially, Hey, you said this, tell me more about that. Let me understand that more, you know, just like really providing that feedback or making sure the other person feels understood before mm -hmm. you create a solution together. And I love, I love the active listening, um, component to what you just hit on. Um, what else would you say? Cause like one thing you talked about is getting you know, one of the trend words, that you were using in the pre-interview was like just getting established. Right. And I think, you know, that word is important for a lot of military members that are getting out, having multiple careers, feeling underemployed, feeling under challenged and in, in, in the civilian workforce. Right. And they're always figuring out how to get established, but also having a career path that's challenging and they're being paid what they're worth and they love where they work. Right. And, you know, mm -hmm. they just feel like they're living on purpose and working on purpose. Right. What's your definition of getting established? Applicable today in this day and age, getting established is stepping outside of your comfort. Now, listen carefully to this stepping outside of what you call your comfort zone and being open and scared at the same time. So absorb that. And what I mean by that is a good, a good starting thing for anyone to get established, take out a piece of paper. On the piece of paper, write down purpose and goal. And your purpose needs to be the first thing that comes to mind for a person. And your goal, how are you gonna achieve it? and map it out. So for anyone out there, good a good lab for finding yourself, but being authentic, not fake to who you are, is get on LinkedIn, open that account, and engage your veteran communities and groups. Start reaching out to people in your branch if that makes you more comfortable and ask them their stories and they're so that's the whole fruit of linkedin is when you get on there you find at first you fall into habit you gravitate to those you know and those you feel comfortable and camaraderie with but slowly you start to get curious and you branch out and you ask more questions. And then the people you continually meet, they'll say, hey, I got this person or that person, meet this person. So you, I call them e-handshakes. So every, you are That's making, awesome. yes. I it's, like that. I call it, you know, just like iPhone has I this, I that. It's the e-shake. 
it's the e-gratitude, you know, it's the e-camaraderie, it's e-confirmation, collaboration, whatever you want to call it. But yeah, in the digital world, you have to be open and be because with being fake, people can spot it. Mm. And there's a fiber within us that when you're authentic, you're like a light in a lot of darkness and mm. people will, will seek you out. So when they get on LinkedIn, that's their starting place. And also after you get your veteran groups, branch out, start hitting up a lot of recruiters, meaning civilian recruiters, not <laughs> military, but every and all you look for keywords like recruiter, headhunter, and look for them in your area or wherever you plan on transitioning to. Trust me, they are always willing because they know the value and the skill set of a veteran, and they will attempt to uh, get you a, a put into a position that in now in this day and age, they will definitely put you not ahead of the others, but there is a skill set and a type of tailor-made behavior that you can only get out of veterans. I, I can't say it, but that's where I would start. And you will feel uncomfortable sometimes because you won't know what to say when someone inbox you or a title of someone really high that you my first conversation with the CEO, I stuttered through every single word, but he was amazing. Roger, at the time, it was Roger Lynch of Sling TV. He was a branch of, I believe, Direct TV or Dish, and they started the, the streaming network. Mm. So it, it was amazing to have that conversation back then and i stuttered every which way through but it was amazing so i'm not the only one thank nope. god but no <laughs> thanks thanks for uh thanks for not only mentioning your definition but also how to get established too i heard yeah. a great framework um start with your purpose tying it to your goal and then also even a solid tool like linkedin it's a gr it sounds like it's been a very valuable professional networking tool for you, Susan. And I definitely ambitious to encourage you to get out there and leverage some of the tips and tricks that Susan's talking about. Now, one last question I have on that before we move to the last segment of the show, Susan, is how intentional are you with networking? Are you industry specific? Um, you know, say I'm a, I'm a ambitious vet that's not just trying to find my next job. Maybe I'm just trying to network with other people in my industry? Are you market? Are you focusing on the market? Like, um, is it just general interest? Like, what are you, how, how intentional do you get with your, with your networking on LinkedIn? Because there's also those people that will just go in and hit connect with everyone. And then you get people that have 10,000 connections, but they couldn't give you a E handshake if their life depended on it, because they don't even know who that is. Right. So let's be real with that. So how how do you how are you intentionally networking on LinkedIn? Um, so for the people that are in my profession, I'll inbox them, but I'll be very honest with you. I will just hit connect. I will. I will look for people in my industry and just hit connect. And I am, I never, never exclude anyone that wants to connect or that I connect with. Because what you see on their LinkedIn profile or what their current title is today does not speak of who they are and, and what their core is. And they may, may not have found their purpose. So mm -hmm. I am not a person that's targeted. My content draws people in. And sometimes I'm just there as a, a support. I Even people in third world countries, I will still connect with them because there's such a disconnect, but it's also teaching me empathy and compassion because their cost of living, their way of life is much more difficult. And it makes me appreciate the things that I have been blessed with. And mm. if, and in some cases, I've actually sent old devices that I've wiped or books. I've actually shipped them to other countries just to help the people on the other end get, because a book here is just a book we put on a shelf, but in other countries, so they have to go to certain places just to get that, to even get an internet connection in this current day and age. Yeah, so, we forget about that. Yep. Yeah. 
We do. No, so it sounds like for you, like your way of using LinkedIn is more of like, hey, I just want to serve. I want to make a difference with as many people as possible. And if that's your, if that's your purpose behind it, your intention, you know, great, right? I would just add some fuel to that fire to Ambitious Vet that, you know, usually how I'm connecting is we all get inundated with connection requests. Um, from mm-hmm. all kinds of people. I, I always like to, if I'm getting inbound connections, ask them, Hey, how, how, you know, how did they hear about me to kind of weed out the Autobot messaging? How did they hear about me? How can they see us potentially collaborating um, to kind of just see if they do get back and if they do turn into a human, right? Cause like you said, like, you know, technology is a starting point, but you want to see if they're actually human behind that technology too. But also when I'm reaching out, it's like I'm very intentional with like, hey, what's like some key goals that we have, you know, professionally and who are some people that we could potentially add value with and start finding decision makers in different industries. If I'm looking to career advance, I mean, I would just start to what Susan's saying is find the recruiters head of hunters and start getting on their calendar, requesting appointments and getting informational interviews of what opportunities they have and how you can align different collateral that you have around your human capital, like resume re- resumes or different tools that you can leverage to uh, get those opportunities, but make sure you're being intentional and don't yeah. be like guys that I used to work with in the corporate world to just sit there and hit connect all the time and see who has the highest LinkedIn network at the end of the day. It's kind of just like, it's freaking pointless and hollow. Make sure you have a quality network. And Susan, is there anything thing- you would add to that? Yeah. Oh, yeah, definitely. There is another if they want to do another thing also. Well, when they get on LinkedIn, that first picture that they put up, um, they're going to be surprised that they will get connection requests from people they have no idea that they've ever met, except them. When they put their picture up, they need to put on the frame of their LinkedIn open to work because that right there, it, it takes all the guessing out. So if I'm a recruiter and you have a certain skill set that I need and you have that open to work, I'm going to immediately connect with you. I'm going to inbox an opportunity to you. It may be temporary. It may be long term. And in this day and age, these people uh, can get remote jobs while they transition. So, mm-hmm. you know, there's so many options. But the key thing is putting open to work around that picture. And that in itself is going to get their connections going. That's a really good tip. And I think there's even a feature behind it that you can actually ping recruiters and headhunters. I don't know the name of it to where you can actually, based on LinkedIn's algorithm, when recruiters look for current job, you know, people, talent in different geographical areas, if you have this, you know, feature setting turned on on top of the the picture um you know you'll the algorithm will prioritize your profile popping up which is which is definitely a good a good tool as well oh, right and yes and another thing is um let's say they want to transition out into an environment that they're still comfortable with but it's still civilian still corporate um usa uh jobs dot gov, uh, dot gov yeah, um, they can do that. So the biggest thing is besides the open to work below, like, for example, they can visit my LinkedIn and they could see I have GS 11, GS 10. I don't know what I have on there. But um, when you transition to the civilian sector doing a government based job with a security clearance, you you will get the pay that you're entitled to. So if you get out of the job, if you get out of let's say in my case, the Marine Corps as an E5, um, depending on what they, they have to pay you at a minimum of a GS pay grade. So mm-hmm. I would get a minimum pay grade um, of a GS nine or maybe 10. And then after a year, you would get to that higher pay grade. So your caption under your picture if you are wanting to transition into those like the usajobs.gov option, make sure you put your pay grade. So that's easy to find. You can even Google E5 equals what GSA, GS pay grade and put that schedule under. So that way, if I'm a veteran and I'm working in a job that's civilian on a base and I need someone on a GS10, GS11 pay grade with a certain skill set. 
I'm going to hit you up and I'm going to say, hey, there, um, go to USA jobs.gov we just opened a rec for a job there here's the number apply and they're putting that opportunity in your lap it's on you now to just pick it up yeah <clears throat> no that's cool i i did not know that our you know like me in my case an e4 getting out of the marine corps directly translated the gs but i also never went the government route either which is you know, it's so interesting. Great tips. And USA, um, is it usajobs.gov? Yes. Platform? And, it, cool. and they have to keep, uh, never lose that DD-214. They are always going to ask for that because they want to see how much time you serve to, to, even if you don't know what your GS pay schedule should be, that what you should, uh, your pay rate should be, your DD-214 is going to calculate that for you because they cannot underpay you. So that is probably like, instead of going from military to total opposite corporate, you can do a medium or a hybrid by doing the usajobs.gov with your DD-214 and any applicable things that they ask of. Interesting. Interesting. No, that's awesome. And uh, I'm sure if... Uh... An ambush event that's listening to this right now has more um, questions that they would have around this, Susan. You'd be open to connecting with them on LinkedIn, right? Mm -hmm. I'll have your LinkedIn profile in the show notes below so you can make sure you answer any other questions that they may have around this. Does that sound good? Absolutely. Absolutely. Perfect. 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 Well, thank you for just sharing all those practical tips, those tools, and some of the things you've learned. Uh, possibly the hard way, like a lot of us do when we get out of the military. But I want to kind of start summing this up with the last segment of the show, which is the one last golden grenade, or as I was telling you, the, the last saved round, right? And, uh, you know, there's an ambitious vet that's out in the trenches of life right now that's been out for at least a few years now that, you know, has the basics down for basic needs. And Ambitious Vet, if you're listening to this right now and you're someone that's still in the uniform that's just like, well, yeah, but I'm still in. Well, listen to this golden grenade from how you can get ahead of um, what an Ambitious Vet is dealing with a few years uh, post-military as well. But like what we have found is there's a vet that's out there that's has the basics down of career stability and stuff like that, but is lacking a deeper sense of satisfaction, or maybe they're not career fulfilled, um, lacking a sense of purpose, or maybe they're just lost, right? What would be that one last golden grenade that you would provide to that ambitious vet before we say goodbye? I would say to them that they have to take a deep breath and you're not perfect. And it's okay to take things in a different time span. Um, growth is every single day. So if you're not where you want to be today, it's not a race. You'll get there and be vulnerable to the people around you. And everyone you meet on a daily basis in person online is an opportunity to connect and better your skills. So if you're lacking and you don't know, tap your buddy on the shoulder and say, what do I got to do? Be vulnerable, be open to criticism and grow from it. Yeah. Yeah, no, that's great. Like you said earlier, open and scared at the same time. Woo, that's, and, that's uncomfortable. And definitely, yes. And definitely when you elevate or you reach where you wanted to be and you find your purpose, my biggest thing that I always tell everyone, look back bring your buddies, the ones that, that are hungry to get to somewhere, or you see um, no spark in their eyes, or they're losing motivation, mm -hmm. reach back, pull them up, um, yeah. give back. And, and if you get an opportunity that you're going to pass up, don't let it go to waste, pass it on to somebody in your network, or that you know, is in a worse position than you that could actually benefit from it. So always give back once you get to where you want to be. Mm, yeah, that's a good point. And uh, yeah, all those. Yeah, one thing I want to add to that, because this is still real for me when you just said that is like, there's going to be even when you're out of the uniform, your old buddies and pals that you served with that were you friends mm -hmm. that you went out on libo and got crazy with, <laughs> you know, um, they're going to be reaching out to you and you may be on a whole nother 
level as far as financial success, career success, or whatever, always make sure that you do give them the time because you never know what they're dealing with, right? And they may be reaching out to you because you do inspire them or vice versa. Maybe there's a guy or a gal that you served with that you got crazy with on Libo and they're on a whole nother level. Reach out to them and uh, be vulnerable, be open and scared at the same time. And you'd be surprised what, what, what comes of it. You know what I mean? Um, and that connection will never leave. Oh my gosh, mm-hmm. that, that connection we had in the Marine Corps will never leave. Oh, right. And it doesn't even matter if you're old or young, if, if I, a veteran that's like in his sixties or seventies, see someone that's young and they're a veteran, they, they hug you like you served with them and vice versa. You hug them back the same way. So it's, it's a brotherhood and sisterhood. Really, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, for sure. So Susan, where can an ambitious vet that's listening to this right now, go and connect with you and learn more about you. Um, they can find me on LinkedIn. I am Susan Samoz, and you can search up Frontier or put in Susan Samoz, comma, Frontier Communications, and I should be the only one. And uh, you'll find me. It says E5 right below my picture, and it says Open to Work. Perfect. And Ambitious Vet, that um, link for her LinkedIn profile will be in the show notes below. So one click of the button, you can be connecting with Susan Samos as well. Susan, I just want to say thank you for joining the Ambitious Vet Show. It's been a blast uh, connecting with another Marine. And uh, yeah, just thanks for sharing some practical step-by-step tools for an Ambitious Vet to go out there and start thriving in their life post-military. Thanks for joining the show. Oh, thank you for having me and can't wait to see the good things that come from it. The Ambitious Vet is available on all popular podcast platforms. Go to VetTrainingCoaching.com to subscribe, rate, and share with fellow vets. Want to dive deeper with the Ambitious Vet Network? Well, now we can make that easier. Go check out VetTrainingCoaching.com. Once that pop-up pops up, enter your name and your email and make sure you subscribe to our weekly newsletter where on a weekly basis, you're going to get the latest content that we've released, some recent updates that only our email list are getting, and some of the latest and newest opportunities to fuel your post-military ambitions. And also, on top of that, here in the next coming weeks, we're going to be launching our brand new website and our community learning platform, and we're going to open up um, our platform, our subscription-based platform for some beta users. And we want you to be one of the first ones. So if you're ready um, to go dive deeper, subscribe to the newsletter, get the latest news, figure out opportunity to fuel your ambitions. And if you want to get even more involved, make sure that you apply for our platform here in the coming weeks, which all that news will be announced in inside our weekly newsletter. We hope to see you on the other side. Take care.